Please welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is nine o'clock, which means it's time for a talk magic. And today I am sitting down and interviewing uh, one of the top dealers in the UK, uh, a, a performer, a creator, an innovator. He has multiple businesses. He's super successful, really nice guy, a reviewer of Mac. This guy does so much. He makes me tired just watching the stuff and the output he comes out with. And everybody speaks so highly of him. I am, of course, talking about the one and only James Anthony. How are you doing? James you're right I'm very well how are you I'm good it's almost Christmas thanks for inviting me on to your show thank you for coming on the show seriously it's um I know how busy you are you just told me off camera how busy you are we've been trying to organize this for about three weeks and your schedule is manic so thank you for squeezing a little bit of time in with me I really appreciate it no no problem at all I've been looking forward to it it's nice to do more things like this I wish I well I was doing more like this I know. And that's one thing that we're going to get into a little bit later on. And when I talk about you being busy, you've got so many different aspects of your business that are taking off in different directions. And you're, you're juggling all these different plates and trying to make sure they're all spinning, you know, and it's, I, I know yeah. how difficult that can you be. Know what so it's I, like. I've seen your goal list from last week on Facebook. That's yeah. a mighty goal list. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's it's aspirational put it that way yes. <laughs> it's very aspirational you will achieve um, that I hope so I hope so that's my goal my goal is to uh, achieve it but we'll see I've already kind of got one of them in the bag so we're uh, we're a tenth of the way there I'm gonna I'm gonna be positive Brilliant. Um, but this is not about me this is about you now yeah. For people that don't know who you are, I mean, obviously, everybody in the UK knows James Anthony, but there might be people outside of the UK, and, and there's a big audience, probably over 70% of the people that watch this channel that aren't in the UK, that might not have heard about you. Okay. Um, so I want to I wanna, uh, kind of give everyone a bit of a frame of reference. I always do this in my interviews, and start off by talking a bit about you, a bit about your background, okay. and kind okay. of where you came from, and then we can talk about all about what you're doing right now. So... Sure. Let's start at the very beginning. What was your origin story, James? What got you into uh, what got you into magic? My origin story. Um, yeah, I heard you ask this to Vinny last week. So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, essentially, I my origin story. I don't want to go too much into what I did before the magic, but I started off as a, an ice skater. That was my my wow. my life up till the age of eighteen. Are you joking? That's amazing. No, no I was an ice dancer, British junior champion, night night seven. A long, long, long time ago. So wow. uh, did all the jumps, all the spins, and danced with the partner as well, Torblin Dean style, I guess. Did all of that. 6 a.m. starts every day. And in between all of that, I... Where was I that first got into my... Right, someone at school, I was about 12, 13, brought in a book on magic. And I just took that book home, kind of stole it off him when he wasn't looking, learned a few of the tricks out of it really badly of course as you do and I just kind of like got addicted to it just learning a little trick by little trick by little trick not having a clue of where it would take me of course this is just at that young naive age uh, so it wasn't the Paul Daniels magic set that started it off of course that's something that we all had when we were younger but when I when I read that book I kind of I don't know something about it just grabbed me I started learning new tricks and every week, just showing little tricks to my family. And then it built up to a point when I was working at a garden centre and in Marple Bridge. And that garden centre, the guy there knew the, the owner of the Midland restaurant, which was across the road. And it was like a family run restaurant, a brewer's fair at the time. So I've been doing magic now for about a year. And just and how, old you, how, old, how old are you at this point, by the way? About 13 and a half, 14. Okay, right. Found about. And uh, then at, the, at that time, I didn't know whether I liked stage or whether I liked close up, or I didn't even know what really all this was. I just did it. I enjoyed the, oh, going back on myself a bit before that. In between all of this, we found out there was a market stall in Stockport. And I used to go there once a week. I used to drag my mum along and she used to, uh, invest in the odd little trick for me especially my dad more than anything because we were very much a theatrical based family mm. and then the garden center guy introduced me to the owner of the restaurant and said that it would be perfect for me to do magic around the tables once a week every Sunday and that's where I started from the age of 14 I got my first gig uh, every week every Saturday every Sunday or every Saturday I forget now um for nearly seven years or six years roundabout, I did magic there 
and sometimes extra days as well. You know, sometimes on the Sundays I came in for a little extra thing, uh, Christmas periods almost every day. So it was, it was a really great learning experience. And that is how I, that, I, I pretty much bring the whole base of my learning of magic, of performing and how to introduce myself and how to interact with people down to that. Well, when you have a regular gig, no matter what age you are, when you have a regular gig and you go in there every yeah. single week, or it, it, it teaches you, you get so good so quickly at close-up magic. Yeah. It teaches you how to approach groups of people, how to deal with different types of people, how to, it, it, you're always working on new material. It's, it's Indeed, exactly. It's the best thing that you can do, isn't it? To like, exactly. A really, yeah. So, so yeah, it's gained so much from that. So you're doing that, but I'm guessing, even though you would, you had a regular gig, yeah. I'm guessing magic wasn't your big thing because you're talking about how you're a skating champion. And, and yeah. I, I know how my, I've got a friend who actually works with my kids company and she's a, like a, a, a professional um, ice skater. So I know how much time she yeah. puts into doing that. And she's got like, so I know that in order to get to the level that you're telling me you're at at 18, mm. that must have been your primary focus. Am I, am I right? And that was the magic. Completely, yeah. Yeah. completely it had to be because I've been working at it since such a young well I say young I wasn't the earliest of ages getting into skating I was, I think I was about nine or ten but I very quickly picked it up and uh, I was still competing around about that age of 17 18 which is when I stopped in the end um, but very much it was every day six six a.m starts weekends mornings sometimes evenings and uh, I trained with um Joan Slater, who was the mother of Karen and Nikki Slater, who competed at the same time. Uh, they're on, I think, the uh, Strictly Ice, ice Dancing program, dancing and also, ice, yeah. which I never watch. I should watch, uh, but <laughs> um, I don't know. It's one of those things I can I can't watch it, so I don't know why. Mm. And um, yeah, what, same time as Torben Dean. What made you, if you don't mind me asking, and I hope it's not a personal question, what made you stop doing the? ice skating was something that you've spent so much time in early starts late finishes dedicating your life yeah uh, you know probably you know d d d pushing everything yep. else to one side what made you decide to go well you know what it was a big big decision um the lots of things because at that age of course i'm going to school then i'm going to college um began to get other interests so some of those interests were computers uh, technology websites so I was at one point in a, an apprenticeship with an internet company in Stockport. And then I was training every day around all of this, doing competitions. But for maybe a three year period before I stopped skating, I was doing magic everywhere. And somebody said to me once, no, somebody said to me along the lines of they knew that I was going to quit and become a magician before I had a clue. For me, my life was ice skating. But I was still doing magic everywhere I possibly could to every single person in the ice rink as I was growing up. And uh, everywhere I went, I was doing a little trick here. And it was apparently obvious that that was going to take over. Then uh, on top of that, ice skating is a short lived career. Um, there was a pivotal point where I either continue and it's not cheap. It's bloody expensive to buy the boots, the blades, the dancing, the lessons cost fortune then the outfits that you have to wear all the poncy outfits and things all of that it costs an absolute arm and a leg the travel then you have broad travel and then I had to ask myself do I wish to be um once you finish competing you only have really one option is to teach or do shows and again shows is short life lived so you then have the option of teaching and for me I didn't really see myself teaching ice skating for the rest of my life but I certainly saw myself doing magic because it was fun. Wow. And I think as you become so, young and you're sociable and you want to go out and you want to meet girls and all that, magic is great. So did you... Oh, it really is. <laughs> I imagine it's easier to get a girl doing them a magic trick than it is saying, hey, look at my ice skating outfit. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. Um, so, so you made a decision to quit ice skating, which was, as you said, a really big decision. Mm. Did you then throw yourself into the magic or did you kind of... Because you talked about how you had an apprenticeship and this and that and the other. Yeah. Did, did magic take over as a full-time thing then? Or was that did that happen later on? That happened later on, definitely. That happened a good number of years later. Um, while I was in the apprenticeship for the internet company, that's how I set, set up Magic World. So they, they taught me, instead of actually asking me to do all their work, apart from making cups of tea all day, they had me 
hard coding HTML, learning from scratch how to do tables, and then encouraged me to set up a website, a magic shop. So I set up Magic World. I was young. My dad invested in an Amstrad computer for me, got the internet, and um, got going. I got the domain name, luckily, back when it was a good time to get them, and set up this website that I don't think I knew what I was doing, I'll be honest, back then. I just kind of went with the flow and took a little bit of advice from everyone that I met, and slowly, because I, I think over the years it's built up, it's just been a a great investment back at the time. But yeah, I didn't know what I wanted to do back then. I didn't know I wanted to be a magician. I didn't know I wanted to be a magic shop owner. I didn't know anything for a good couple of years after that. Wow. So so you created well uh, to you created Magic World while you're in this apprenticeship. Yes. Did you then keep it up or did it kind of fall to one side and you picked it up later on? No, I kept it up like crazy. So oh, wow. I was in that apprenticeship for about two years left there and I was I think I'd just finished skating by that point and I was looking at all my different options I think my mum wanted to be, be uh, go into programming and different things like that that never appealed to me at all it had to be I think that by that point a couple of years later magic was the thing that was kind of like taking over my dad was encouraging me and my dad was an opera singer retired for opera north and very larger than life character 10 times more than I'll ever be. I mean, he's jumping up and down and singing in front of people on holiday, everywhere he gets. Um, so I got that sort of performance bug from him. And because of that, he encouraged me to go for the dreams. And then I think about a year, year after that, it was that difficult decision of telling my mom and telling family, I don't want to do skating anymore. And they'd put all that money into it over the years. But then, you know, at first they thought, I think my mom especially, you can't do that because you're not going to make money from magic. So uh, it took a lot to convince. And then down the line, it kind of clicked that actually we're doing quite well here. <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. So what advice, before we move on, what advice would you, because I get this all the time on the channel. People ask, oh, my family aren't, um, aren't, aren't uh, supportive of me. I want to become a magician full time. And, and they're, yeah. they're, they're telling me to get a proper job. I know you didn't get that because especially your dad being an opera singer, he yeah, would know yeah. the sacrifices that you need to make. But do you have any advice for people that are watching this that are kind of wanting to go full time, but they're not getting the support because it can be very difficult. And it, it is. You know, it's, I, if you don't have the support of your loved ones or anyone or your girlfriend or anybody, it's really difficult to, to clear your, your brain really and say to yourself, I've got to go for this. Uh, we do listen to other people. We are influenced by our family more than anyone else. What I'd say is find a friend or find someone who does actually support you, sometimes your partner, and really, you know, feed off that a lot. At the end of the day, it is your decision. You've got to, you've got to think wisely. Do you really enjoy magic that much that it's something you see yourself doing for the rest of your life or for a long period? And if it is, go out there, find, either be on the street, do some magic, find a restaurant, ask if you can do some magic. I was doing magic back in the day for 20 quid an hour, and that was a lot of money for a 14-year-old. And, and I had so much fun doing it. So don't think about the money, don't think about the career. If you're too young, just get out and enjoy your magic. You might have to have a second job at the same time. You might be working to be, I mean, I have no friends who have got their graduation as lawyers, and like Vinny as well, you know, uh, have a backup if you can have a backup my backup is my printing business um, but I didn't know that till later on in my career and I guess not every young person knows what they want to do either so yeah. I'd say when you don't know what you want to do enjoy the magic because mm -hmm. it's so easy when you get older to not lose that enjoyment but to stray away from it and when you're younger and you're learning magic they were the most fun times of my life and I am getting that back right now. But how do I, am I kind of going around the houses here? Yeah, no, or? no, no. This is incredible advice. I understand exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not very good at, you know, getting straight to the point. There's so many branches really to that answer, but it is just get out there, do it. Don't be put off. And mm. uh, yeah, I have a backup as well. <laughs> Yes, 100%. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. really good advice. So when did you start performing? So you, 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 you obviously set up 
Magic World. You were still doing a whole bunch of other stuff as well. Yeah. When did you go full time as a performer stroke magic shop owner? When did you kind of go, right, OK, I don't need any other income. Now I'm just going to focus primarily on magic. Because right. obviously, I know you've got a printing business, yeah. but that yeah. came down the line. So yeah, that wasn't that wasn't at this point. Yeah. So it was, I think, how old was I when I first started getting more gigs? I think I was probably about 15, 16 when I started branching out away from the restaurant, getting more gigs. But more, I was, I would say 17 or 18. That's when I started promoting myself, getting a couple of little parties here, a few little jobs here, but not a lot. Um, because I still wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do. Um, and then... <clears throat> really hard to say exactly what I'm trying to go back in time to it's, everything a, it's hard isn't it to look back in yeah it is sometimes um I don't know I think with the current circumstances we kind of forget what's happened after two or three years yeah <laughs> like, we do don't we? yeah 100 um, but yeah it go back to the question again yeah yeah, yeah absolutely like it's just when did you decide to go full-time yeah so it was about I was about 22 23 I'd say Okay. 22, 23. Okay. And at the same time, the website continued to have bringing in sales. So it started off really, really small. I set up the website uh, with the internet company. And I think maybe five months later, I got my first sale or four months, something like that. And I, was, I couldn't believe it. Money came in. You know what you like at that age. And slowly then more and more sales started coming in. And it, by no means was it a full time it would it was a long way off i mean we're talking five six seven years away before even close to being able to pay for all my bills but i knew i was on the right road uh, yeah. i had lots of people who helped me out along the way uh there was a magician um called doug greg in chester at the time and i think i found him in the yellow pages <laughs> and, but i went there and just introduced myself uh, rang him up once he said yeah come around quite scary doing that nowadays but yeah just went around learn magic and he became a really good friend helped me out with a lot of the stage side because he used to do the stage magic and then also in Offerton we had a guy called David Duval who was a famous escapologist and uh, he and his wife uh, not his wife I shouldn't say that sorry uh, Jean uh, helped a lot with the development of me as, a, as the not just as a magician but also more for the actual shop side I started off by wholesaling their products because they were local. They manufactured all their own tricks and they focused on escapology equipment. So I think for the first six years, Magic World was selling uh, escapology. They were selling all the trick handcuffs, oh. grease lightning handcuffs. And that was, I think I can credit Magic World for getting being planted on the map because of that, by focusing on something that not every other magic shop was selling. Mm. Yeah. And... Um, yeah, without that, I, I don't know if it would have been the same same shop it is today, to be honest. That's great. Well, I mean, now we think of Magic World and it's it's up there as one of the top mm -hmm. dealers, you know, out there, especially in the UK. Um, and you have your own range of tricks and, you, yeah. you you know, you bring your own products out as well as yep. other people's coming in. I Somebody asked me a question on my channel a few years ago, uh, a few years ago, a few months ago, and they said, mm. would you ever open up a magic dealership? And I said, absolutely, not in a million years. Yeah. Uh, it, it must be a very hard job in a very, it especially is. with the fact that like you've got this one overarching um, uh, wholesaler, which is Murphy's. Yeah. So every yeah. it's hard to differentiate because everybody's selling the same tricks because it everything is. comes through that. It know, is difficult. Isn't it? Well, it was like I say, at least seven years before Magic World was earning enough to actually kind of pay for some bills and go for things. Then I had the performing as well, which came in, but. I remember at one point in my life, I moved out to another house and I was sharing with a friend. First time I ever did that. And, um, you know, at that age, you don't look at your accounts. You have no idea. You just kind of go out there and do it. And then suddenly you realise, OK, actually, I'm not earning as much money as I thought because he had to move out. I was paying for the whole full house. I couldn't afford it. So I had to, I was probably about 18, 19 at this point or 19, 20 maybe. And I moved out and had to go back with my family for another few years. And then finally got my first place but it was uh definitely seven or eight years after <laughs> 27 before it was a point where it was actually paying for everything then i realized of course you can do wedding magic uh you can do corporate magic and uh i built on that but okay. before we get into like the magic world side of things i was very much one thing that i 
have to say is that I got into magic not knowing whether what was stage or um, close up, which one I wanted to do, but I did mix uh, magic, illusion, dancing, because uh, I used to do a lot of ballroom dancing as part of training for ice skating. So I created a show called Latin Magic. And hmm. I created the illusions. We went on the cruise ships doing illusions for six to seven years. And while I was doing that, Magic World was just steadily running in the background. My dad was going around the corner to David Vow to pick up all the stock. And um, he was doing all the shipping and all the magic boxes and everything while I was away on a cruise ship, just docking in occasionally, getting on the internet that's really bad, checking in. So everything's kind of like been run, but kind of, uh, you know, it's hard to focus on one thing while you're off on a cruise ship doing magic. So I was kind of, I guess, finding what I wanted to do in life, finding whether I wanted to be a stage magician, whether I wanted to be a close-up magician, whether I wanted to uh, work on the cruise ships for the rest of my life or whether I wanted to set up, you know, I don't know exactly, just work on what it was I wanted to work on, essentially. But it's nice that you had all these options open to yeah. you, because, you know, yeah. what you've just said there, you know, going on cruise ships, that's something that a lot of performers aspire to. That's their ultimate goal. Yeah. Oh, one day I would make it if I got to be a cruise ship performer. You're yeah. you're doing it for seven years, kind of thinking, is this what I really want to do? Uh, yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And also, you get so good doing cruise ships. You know, I speak yeah. to a lot of acts that that say, yeah. "Hey, I, you know, it makes you so polished because you're doing the same show over and over and over and over again." Yep, it certainly does. It certainly does. And uh, I think I have my only regret is not bringing in enough music. Like I was doing two forty-five minute shows at the time, big illusions, um, but I kind of wish I was uh, bringing in more tricks regularly. So if I ever had that opportunity again, I would definitely not just stick to the same routine I did started at the beginning. I think maybe four years down the road, I maybe introduced about six, seven new effects, but I wasn't trialing out, doing new things and pushing the boundaries as much as I probably could have done. So I'd say if you ever get an, any opportunity to be in front of a live audience, regularly doing the same show, don't be afraid of putting new things in, trying things and really pushing the limits of your performance and your scripting. That's really good advice. Really, really good advice. When you finished working on cruise ships, did you continue to be a stage performer or did you focus on close-up and focus on the, uh, the dealership? I continued, but I focused more on the close-up. So mm -hmm. my illusions were all there ready to go. And um, whenever we got asked to do an illusion show, it could be for a small corporate marquee or it could be on a stage somewhere or it could be, uh, I think, the last one we did. It was uh, one of those Christmas, the last one I ever did was a Christmas party, one of these big places in Event City in Manchester, that kind of thing, where all the corporate people rent a million tables and they got a stage show in between everyone getting drunk and having a crazy party. So that was the last time I got my illusions out, probably about seven years ago now or eight years ago. It's quite sad, really. <laughs> and uh, they're all in my, in my parents' garage now uh, for sale. <laughs> so I'm just telling people they're for sale. Uh, because <laughs> I, I've been so reluctant to get rid of them for so many years and I thought it's now the time but mm. I, I didn't know exactly that I was going to stop until five years ago probably five six years ago it was, it was my decision that I will never get them out again and and what made you go to that decision like what made you decide right that's it because that's another big decision isn't it really okay especially you spent so many years doing that yeah. show to kind of go, right, that's it. I'm drawing a line under that now. Yeah, because I kind of wanted to focus on the close-up. I kind of wanted to focus on the magic world. And by this time, the printing as well had just come in place. And I, I knew I couldn't juggle so many things. Simple as that, really. And I, I kind of, I didn't lose my passion, but it was hard work setting up all the illusions, having the flight cases, the setups, and that is what got me down. And I'll be honest, I love the performing part. If I could just do the performing and not have to do the setups, I would still be doing it today. That's very true. As somebody who does an illusion act, I can yeah. totally and yeah. completely relate to it. You know, it I mean, is, it's so much easier walking up to a gig with a little close-up case yeah. going, right, I'm yeah. done. Yeah. And then walking out compared to, you yeah. know, an illusion act where you need vans and warehouses and, and God knows what. Yeah, but it was worth it. It was worth everything. And just to do that 40 minutes again on the cruise, it's worth all the setup for a day just to do it. Mm. But uh, it comes a point where you do it 
all the time. Right now, now what's my next? What's next in life? Do I stay on the cruise ship and work for the rest of my life? And well, for a good period. And if I did, I probably would have paid off my house three, four times quicker than what I'm doing at the moment. Um, but you sacrifice things. You sacrifice your life at home. You sacrifice who you are at home. So you're not easily going to get as much magic or gigs and bookings when you're at home. But then do you need to? Because you're away on a ship next week for another week. But even then, it's, nothing's guaranteed. And you, no. they could just cut you off and you stop doing cruises. And now where are you? So I was a firm believer of building up the print, uh, magic world, keeping that going and building up the close-up magic, keeping that going. And yeah, I got a little bit lazy as I got older and just carrying a little box and just going there to a wedding. Is It's true what you say, though. I, I know a lot of cruise performers that have stopped doing cruises for whatever reason and they've really yeah. struggled yeah. because that they've never had time to take on any other work so they didn't bother marketing or promoting themselves mm. and and when that work goes they're kind of left in limbo yeah. with nowhere yeah. to go and nowhere to turn and exactly despite yeah. being incredible performers there's no work coming in yeah. it can be an issue yeah but then i mean in so way, so many ways it's great because you you're not really you're not paying attention to the real world. So you're not focusing on what magicians are saying all the time. You're just literally your own creative nature with all your DVDs and following how to do magic, but you're not limited by all the criticism, all the Facebook and all the things that are happening, which I don't know if it's a good or bad thing. Who knows? Yeah, I, I again, completely agree with you. We're totally on the same page here. I'm going to ask you one question before we move on from yeah. that, as you brought up stage magic. Do you have any advice of moving from close-up to stage as somebody who started off as close-up, moved on to stage, then went back to close-up? Uh, any uh, uh, sort of advice for how to go from one? Because it's a completely different thing. It is. Completely it is. different thing. Uh, I would say, I mean, it's been a while since I've thought about all the close, you know, the stage magic side and the theory, but I would say, what first of all, before you do any of it, get some books on stage magic, on presentations and personalities. Because who do you want to be? Do you want to be that extravagant David Copperfield doing some artful movement on stage? Or do you wish to just be stood there doing mentalism and creating intrigue? Work out your character, who you want to be, then build it around that. Look at ways you can improve your performance by other means outside of magic. So... Mm. For me, it was the ballroom and Latin dancing that got me into Latin magic. And that's what made the act stand out. We were one minute doing a cha or a rumba while handcuffs were jumping off me and appearing on someone else. And uh, es escapology built in with it. So it is about finding who you are, who you'd like to be on stage. And that's not something that's going to come out immediately. So you might want to test and try different personalities as such. Mm. Um, and while we always say be yourself on stage you don't have to be you can be anybody you want you can invent personalities you can do anything and where do you want to be in five ten years I mean it's a tough question for anyone but do you want to be doing that show as that character or do you want to be doing this show as that character and really just get in front of a camera play around with different things and kind of look at other artists and see which ones do you gel to, which ones do you like, which ones are you inspired by, and then go in that direction. But have a clear focus on which direction you want to go in. Great. Very good advice. Again, very good advice. Um, so where are I... Right, okay. So we've kind of covered a lot of your career. Where are you... Uh, Put aside the printing business. We'll get to this in a minute. Yeah. Where are you right now with performing versus being a magic dealer? And the reason I bring that up is I spoke to Peter Nardi on this channel. Yeah. And he told me the story about how he loves performing, but his dealership, Alakazam, takes up so much of his energy. He just had to stop performing completely outside of friends and family yeah. and doesn't have time to perform anymore because it's such a, a full-on thing running Alakazam. Now, I know, yeah. I mean, we've been to gigs before. We've worked at the same close-up job together more yeah. than once. I know that you go out and gig. Is, is it still something that you go and perform? Are you still performing now? Or is the focus primarily on other things? Definitely performing, 100%. So I have... Uh... Okay, I'm performing, but I'm not pushing the boundaries in my performance side. I've uh, noticed in the last two years that before everything happened, I was at the top of Google for Manchester Magician, literally the top. And now I'm not anywhere to be seen. 
I've let my guard drop and I've done that because I'm not focused. I'm not as focused as I would normally be in my performing because my attentions have been taken with the magic world. And like Pianardi says, it's a lot of work creating a, sh a shop, keeping it going, marketing, inventing new tricks. And um, that's one of the reasons why I've, I am a solid performer. I'm always out there doing gigs, but I'm not one of these doing, I'm not claiming to be doing 30 gigs a month every single day throughout December. Nah, I've, I've got three gigs this month. Uh, two of them were canceled. It's, it's just, I have enough to keep me going. I do wedding fairs when I need to, and I get my weddings booked in for a couple of years in advance. Um, but I'm just happy doing 10, 12, 20 gigs a year, whatever it may be. I'm happy with that. I'm not trying to push the boundaries at the moment, just because I know my limitations and I am one of those this personalities that try to do too much. And I fall victim to it all the time. And when you do that, you get stressed. You don't enjoy the gigs as much. Whereas now when I go out, I, I really enjoy them. That's great. So, That's yeah, really cool. I, you know, but I, I do still perform very much. I do my walk around magic. I am a hypnotist by trade as well, which I never really, I have not brought that in to this, but I'm a <laughs> clinical hypnotherapist. Where did that come from? That, that threw me through a six. Where, oh, when, when did that happen? Are we talking about hypnotism as in um uh, for magical purposes or for uh, for entertainment purposes or are we talking about that's what got me into it that's what I, the idea of that stage hypnosis was what originally drew me to it uh, it was seeing a stage hypnotist called david knight on the cruise ships and i wanted to learn it so badly i kept seeing him do his shows and after about nearly a year and a half of meeting him regularly on the ships he eventually trained me up but not without a cost <laughs> it cost me a bloody fortune I went and trained with his proper courses did it uh learning both clinical first and then the stage because for him it was very much learn it properly don't just learn how to do make people's hands stick to their foreheads or whatever learn the clinical side because then you've got a basis then go into the stage side as well so I kind of did it all uh and at the same time I met the grumbleweeds and they were, he was very much doing a lot of hypnosis. So I trained with hypnosis from him. That's where I hypnotized my first person. And he, wow. he taught me how to hypnotize somebody. I put them out. I couldn't believe it. Uh, he left me uh, for a week before he came back on board the ship and gave me scripts and things to write down and things to say. And uh, through those two mixes, that's how I first got into hypnosis. That's incredible. That's awesome. <laughs> I, I love it. So... Then after that, I got into clinical weight loss gastric band hypnosis. And I set up a, uh, I think the website's still up there, but I don't use it anymore, magnosis.co.uk. It's very old pictures of me and Joy, my old assistant in the chair, fast asleep. Um, oh, yeah. But I, I specialized in fears, phobias, uh, but also um, weight loss gastric band. So helping people lose weight, making them believe that their stomach is shrunk, size of a golf ball, and they only eat when they're hungry and stop when they're satisfied. And by doing that, I ended up with five or six clients a day in my old apartment. Um, yeah, and that took up about three years of my life. And then I decided that I don't want to do clinical hypnotherapy. So I stopped. Then I went into stage and finally did my stage show three years or four years after learning the clinical hypnotherapy. And that's not my plan. My plan was learn stage hypnosis, go and be a stage performer as well. Um, but wow. I did my stage hypnosis shows, my first one, uh, way down the line, and I've done about 20, 30 since then. And do you still do that? I've got the show ready to go. Yes, then. I just <laughs> don't push it. I, I've cut, the last time I did one was three years ago now, the corporate gig. Um, so I, it's ready to go, yeah. But I miss that side. If, I, this is my problem. I've got too many things that I do and I never can focus on one thing. So, you know, if anything, I think I preferred the stage hypnosis than the illusions at one point. And if really? I ever went back on the cruise ships, I would go on as a stage hypnotist. Wow. So. Wow. Okay. That's really, really interesting. That's really fascinating. And do you bring elements of hypnotism into your close-up work? Because I see, I don't do any hypnotism. I like watching yeah. it, but I yeah. see 
Uh, you know, I've got friends like Mark Lavelle, for example, yeah. who uh, I see do something like coin vexed and, you know, mm. they're holding this bent coin and they can't open their hand. Yeah. And I look at it and I'm like, that does heighten magic when you're doing it, it close does. up, having that element there. Um, of course. Uh, you know. Yeah, I 100%. I started mixing it in um, a couple of years after I started learning it. Uh, yeah, coin vexed was a perfect classic example because when it's bending in their hand, if you can make them imagine that they're feeling it at the same time, maybe feel a bit of temperature, feel warmth or cold, and at the same time feel it bending, it turns it from just, it makes it more believable that it's yeah. actually happened there and then in their hand. But then if you can also make them not open the hand beforehand, then it totally freaks them out. So all this compounded into a, an effect can definitely make it a wow. miracle. Wow, that's yeah, incredible. So, so uh, let's talk about Magic World because that's obviously you set it up many, many years ago and it's grown yeah. huge now. Like you're, you're doing orders every day. A yeah. lot of people swear by Magic World as their website and that's the place that... Uh, Very nice of them. You, know, you, you mentioned Vinny earlier on. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you think about Vinny and you think about Neo Magic, he just released, he just stocks his own products whilst you stock pretty much everything um, and, and, and stock all of the Murphy's stuff, but you also have your own line of products as well. Because um, he's wise. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you, like, uh, is there an advantage to stocking all of the Murphy's stuff when everyone else does it as well? Or, you know, what made you decide to kind of, because there must be more work in it. Like if you're stocking everything, like yeah. everything, like that, that, the amount of stuff that comes out daily, you must be constantly updating magic. Well, I I don't know. I mean, surely there's more work to it. It's a crazy amount of work, but over the years I've learned how to run it more efficiently. So from websites that are automated and systems automated, all this, I've done everything I can to automate everything I do, whether it be Magic World or any other companies I run, so that I have to do the minimal amount of work and admin. So I, we have the website I mean, for example, we used to have Facebook messages, Instagram messages, we used to have emails, uh, all these different ways of people communicating with you. And we've got rid of all that. We just have an online chat. And even then, we're not always available. We answer within 24 hours. And it, it sounds like, you know, some people say, oh, why can't we just call you on the phone? It's just too much to try and run the company to deal with the magic world, the products from Murphy's Magic and to do all this, and then to spend the time chasing up orders and looking at all the different forms of communication, it just eats into your life. So I had to make that decision. If I do keep Murphy's, I have to reduce and minimize the amount of work that I do, because we don't make a lot out of it, especially after importing and, and everything else. But at the same time, it, it is more of a numbers game. Do I get rid of it completely and focus on my own products? which I do have that option. I've got a button I can click and it turns everything off except for our products. But other people have done that. I think PropDog only sell their own products. Um, and I thought, no, for me, I'm going to continue doing this. Um, it does draw people to the website. And... I imagine if somebody brings out something awesome, like, the, yeah. the, like, I mean, at the moment, the big thing is Switcher 2 by Mark Mason. Switcher 2, which and ABC. Which is... Yeah, which are being distributed by Murphy's. Yeah. If you have that on your site, yep. people might go to your site to see that and then see your own products and go, well, actually, I'll pick that up, but I'll also pick that up and that up and that up. Yeah. 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 Okay. So that's that what um, probably, I mean, I've just launched a new website. It's on uh, WordPress now rather than the old systems I used to use, which now means I can make more customizations myself without, instead of spending thousands of pounds with somebody just to make a few changes here and there. So that's made a massive difference. And uh, focusing on my own products is the next part where I need to start releasing more tricks again, which is something we were trying to release six to 10 tricks a year. So that's starting, we've got, I think, a new trick coming out in a couple of weeks. We've just shipped to Murphy's. I thought I brought them here. No, I didn't. Um, Deadly Mark decks, which are a bugger to make, to be honest, but they are, um, takes 30 minutes to make one deck of these. And it's the touch mark deck where you can actually feel oh. on the back the, what the card is. Mm. And uh, wow. it's an invisible marking system that's printed using our massive machines. Uh, so you, don't, you can be blindfolded. You can tell what the playing card is. 
so we've wow. literally just finished printing 150, sorry, 300 of them in red B, blue B, and blue bicycle, and shipping them today to Murphy's. So in three or four days' time, just a little bit late for Christmas, but maybe just in time for some, they'll be appearing. But That's it is. Right. I wish I was releasing more tricks more speedily. That's the thing. So running it all is it's just too much to do. And for one person. And how, how, how do you, like the tricks that you release, your own product line, yeah. not all of them are created by you. You, you have other artists oh, that no. you, oh, no, yeah. it's, they are all just you, is it? Or no, is no, it, no. They're, they're, yeah. Whoever wants to bring tricks to me, but I'll be honest, we, I do pick and choose very much what I'm releasing because I've got lists now of maybe 20, 30 tricks I should be releasing. I've not got around to releasing them. But I've kind of picked a lot from Julio Montoro. He's become a really good friend over the years. I go out to Spain, we film with him, and I've been releasing several tricks with him that I've got more to more to be coming up. Mark Elsden, we've done a lot with Mark. And um, then I got mixed with myself. And of course, the very first trick that, um, that Vinny brought out, the experiment, um, things like that. So we're always open to ideas that people have. And uh, please do consider coming to us for these routines. We do a great job of the packaging and the creation, of course, with the printed and playing cards. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just, it's a whirlwind of different, different things. So I'm kind of just doing as many as I can, as well as I can. And that's what it's about. I don't want to just release something quickly and do a half-assed job of it. At the end of the day, it's got to have really good videos. It's got to be a product I believe in. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah half the time i'm coming up with ideas and i'm mixing it in with other people's ideas that i've bought and uh bringing them together and releasing them as fast as i can that's amazing and what um i suppose if somebody wants to work with you mm. what and, and they you know they listen to this interview and they think oh yeah. i've got a really good idea i'd like to speak to mm. um you know i'd like to I'd speak, like to speak to james about that Yep. What would what would they do? Is it a case of is there a submission page on your website, or is it a case of just uh, going into the online chat, or how would they? I would how start would they with the online chat right now. There is a submission page, but since switching over to WordPress a few about a month and a half ago, um, that might not be as it was. So we're we're going to fix that soon. So online chat. If you've got an effect, just pop in, shoot a little YouTube video, send it over to us, um, and that way we can see it nice and quickly and. Let us know your thoughts on the product and what it is and what you, you hope to achieve out of it. And certainly we're, we're open to creating the product and making it look absolutely awesome. Brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely awesome. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's great. And, and what made you decide to become a magic reviewer as well? Because the other thing is you make now, because I'm a magic reviewer, I know how much yeah. of a pain in the butt it can be. You, know, yeah. you can't please any, everybody, it's impossible. No. But I, I, I listen to the chatter on the internet and a lot of people go, oh, you can't be a magic, I had this when I, when I was affiliated with World Magic Shop. Yeah. How can World yeah. Magic Shop have a magic, uh, have a review show when they're a magic dealer, surely yeah. you can't be a magic dealer and have a review show and, oh, you should only yeah, be reviewing can. projects if you're not. I know, I know, yeah. I know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what made you decide to go down the route of reviewing? You know, what's... I honestly can't remember. It was, um, it was with Sam Fitton and he suggested that I set up a review show and I had a little shop above a company, uh, not where I'm at currently at now, but five, six years ago, I lived uh, in Bellevue, sort of area, Stockport, Manchester. And um, there I lived, I had a print, and my magic shop was above a printing shop called North, Northern Print. And in there, that's where I did all the reviews. So I kind of, it has been a very much a small growth of one minute going from my dad's sort of like house to running Magic World from my own house, to then having an actual physical magic shop and then jumping to a bigger magic shop or bigger premises. Um, so quite humbling experience going through all of that. But Sam suggested doing the reviews. He came on the very first review. So if you go to the YouTube and search Magic World Review Show and go to the very first one, I think you'll see Sam Fitton with his strong opinions, as always. And uh, it was it just worked really well. So I started off with Sam and I started off with um, Daniel Meadows who was the inventor of the Deadly Mark deck. And he, both of those two people came on quite regularly, I think for the first 50, 60 episodes. Uh, some of my, just me on my own, I just did whatever I could, when I could, with no real goal 
and that's my mistake so that's that's the thing it's like you're goal goal orientated and I can see that in your review show and how you are now that's how I started but without having the goals I just I knew I was going to set one every week didn't exactly know what I wanted to achieve by it especially because I started it at the beginning you know the earlier times of Magic World um but all I know is I enjoyed it and it got me an audience and I did notice sales improving and uh so yeah it was just one of those things that I enjoyed and then for some reason and I don't know why recently I have slowed down with it and I'm sure you might some people might notice that I used to do a show two shows a week and sometimes three products per show and now I just do one product a show and I don't do anywhere near enough review shows and I need to get back into that and I know I will soon but I don't know when. Fair enough well a lot of the you know, you've mentioned in a few things in this uh, interview, like, hey, I used to be on page one of Google and that's, uh, you know, kind of slowly yeah. slipped away and I did review shows and that slowly slipped away. Yeah. And I think a long, a large part of that is because you have this other company. It is. That it's fair to say has blown up and become one of your biggest things. It's getting there. If yeah. not the biggest thing getting that you're there. doing, which is, which is your printing company. Now, mm. this is... I don't know if you've branched out now, but I know when you originally started the company, yeah. it was specifically for magicians printing on playing cards, right? Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. So I, I, tell us about that. Tell us about why you set this up. You've got all this other stuff going on. Yeah. You're a performer, you're I mean, uh, a reviewer, you're a magic yeah. dealer. You know, you've got stage shows going on. That's exhausting, doesn't it? Yeah, That's and then you go, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to set up another company. Let's do print by magic. It's like, what, well, what? Before I bore people with that, I mean by no means is it taken over and i have always i've been at two minds do i do i sell I even maybe last year i was even thinking do i sell magic world move on and do i uh, focus on one area and i very quickly cancelled that out and said no i love my magic i love my performing i love my reviews and uh, this is why i've just built this new little studio this is part of the reason because print by magic has now taken over what was my studio downstairs so I used to have a magic shop downstairs and uh, you'd walk through the magic shop to the studio, to a secret door where I did shows downstairs before the COVID. Um, and then you'd go out the back to a massive sort of like quadruple garage, all beautifully set up. And that's our printing office. But the printing has grown that much that I had to slowly, I got rid of the magic shop because I realized that the amount of time you spend with customers, I'm afraid uh, when they're coming in and not just during the week, but at the weekend, uh, it was eating so much into my life and the printing was coming in that thick and fast. I had to make a decision. Do I continue or do I wipe out the magic shop, which I did during COVID, I'm afraid. Um, it's all online only now, very much so. And just kind of focus on the printing. So I got rid of my studio downstairs, put it up here, still building it at the moment. And uh, the printing shop has just... It just keeps taking over, eating away a little bit more. But I have my limits. It's not going to eat into um, me doing reviews. I'm going to start doing more of those. I'm trying to do everything I can to free up my time so that I have more time to put it into enjoying magic. Yeah. So I can still run Magic World very effectively. It's been doing a great job. And I've got Josh now, my new apprentice, and he's doing all the shipping and all the printing. So it just frees up my time to do more of this. But... The printing did take over and uh, the printing started off from where did it start exactly okay it was a magic it was a fairly well-known printing company that i saw advertising something uh, that's all i was going to say I, i'm quite protective over the actual uh, how we do certain things but the i saw an opportunity and i always wanted to print onto playing cards so i don't know why I, there was some sort of I just felt being, I felt drawn to it and I thought, okay, let's pitch an idea to them. I am going to, these, these printers are crazy expensive. We're talking 30 grand plus to be able to do what I wanted to be able to do. And I couldn't afford that. No way. So I pitched, I went down with a keynote presentation, probably the biggest thing I've ever done in my life. And um, I, after speaking on the phone to one of the sales guys there, eventually he introduced me to the CEO and uh I went down and presented this to him. They put me up overnight and I walked away being the magician on their trade show stand for the next 
well, even up to this day, if they need me, but I did about eight shows for them. I've traveled to all the different European partners for them. And for that, helped towards this printer. And that's how I got into printing playing cards. Wow. Before buying the printer, I did tests on another version of a printer, similar, so that I knew that there was a market. So I went to Hobbs Reaper Graphics in Manchester and I, I just I befriended one of the guys there. The next minute, I'm just testing out the market, seeing if magicians are interested. Then I realized there is a demand here. Probably not enough demand to warrant the cost of the printer, but I just took the leap and I went for it. Well, I know. I mean, and what sort of customers do you have for it? Because I know that, you know, my friend Lloyd Barnes speaks yeah. very highly of you because he's always coming up with ideas for gaffed cards. And yeah. rather than going directly and having a massive print run for whoever is doing it for, yeah. he'll come to you and say, look, can you make these gaffes yeah. for me? I want to. And, and, and I imagine that's one market. I mean, who else do you have? What I mean, are, that's how big names, but I mean, what type of people? Yeah. Well, I mean, oh, is it? it almost, I mean, so many magic shops around the world it could be magic factory, it could uh, right down to performers like um, who, who are, I'm trying to think which performers. Are. We've done it for so many performers uh, around the world who may, may be doing a TV show here. Might, I've done it for Dynamo on his TV show multiple times now. Um, I think where he made a picture appear on the shard, uh, on the glass in front of the kids there. We've We've done it for Richard Jones on his TV show at the very end where he produces the final picture. Um, we've printed for so many magicians and companies like magic shops like Alakazam. And it's just a great way of like before ourselves, I mean, there's no easy way of printing onto a bicycle playing card. You can try, you can get an inkjet printer and do a very poor job or some, you might get lucky here and there with some printers, but we put so much time into the colors, getting them to match the red backs all the colors of the pips to match so you can put one of our gaff cards inside it so you wouldn't tell it it's even there so magicians now who are on television around the world are wanting to to buy them so we kind of do what i think there's another only one other company that i think they've stopped doing it now but zazzle they were printing playing cards on bicycle but what they don't do is the color matching making sure it's right for magicians so that's why we take it one step further and uh, our market really is everyone from people who are inventing tricks or they need a uh, deck of cards for Kickstarter to film with before they go and get all the numbers printed. And um, sometimes it's worthwhile creating and printing with us. And sometimes it's not. If you've got like an, a magic effect with a full deck of cards, for instance, double sided printing, and you expect to package that up and sell it to somebody, you're not going to do that through us because it's no. going to cost way too much. But if you've got a packet effect of five, six, seven cards, yeah, some double-sided, some not, it's instead of spending how, how much, four, five thousand pounds with uh, USPS, it's definitely worth coming to us. And then we print onto the bicycle stock, which is the best thing ever. And Phoenix as well. Wow. And and have you branched out since then, or is that primarily still your market? You you you, you haven't gone into commercial printing and printing leaflets and t-shirts and so, or is that something that you're doing as well? Well, it is, but again, I'm I am diminishing some areas. So we can print on anything. That's the whole slogan. If you go on the website printbymagic.com, you'll notice now it's not as geared to magicians as it was. Uh, there's a magicians tab, and you can get to it very easily. Or if you search playing cards, personalized, bicycle, we come up. But now we are, I'd say probably about 30% regular people and 70% magicians right now. And we're trying wow. to build on, of course, the outside part because the magician side is always going to be there. We're never going to let it go. It's doing great. But printing for wedding exhibitions and the big printing, we've got wide format printers so we can print 1.6 meters. Uh, basically over the years, I've invested tons of money into new systems, new printers, assist, all sorts of things, laser cutters. We've got everything, injection molding machines. Our newest thing is a packaging machine. So uh, I brought a little, a little sample here, but this is something that someone asked me to, we're testing a box at the moment. So you provide us with a template of a box that might be the lines and the creases. And without heavy investment of blades and stuff, we can now do this on a new machine that came during COVID. So any sort of packaging for magicians, again, we love cats here. So we're just playing around with ideas. So yeah, packaging is an area that we're going into with one new machine that I've got. 
Um, and we've done lots of the packaging again for Julio just recently, or any sort of stickers that you need cutting out or whatever, massive vinyl prints, we can do it. That's amazing. That's great. No wonder it's taking up a long part of your time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. And I've, again, it's a learning curve, but I've invested so much in all these new machines, but really I should just focus on one machine. One machine instead of all these machines that can do different things. So I'm now focusing on just certain areas. Packaging is one and magicians still. And the stickers, that's one of the other things, very popular. So learn as we go along. That's incredible. That's incredible. Wow. But I want to ask I, you one more question. Yeah, before you do that, can I will say one thing, though. I am looking for another employer, employee, sorry, I am the employer, uh, to help out with Print by Magic and Magic World. But... If anyone is looking for a job at the moment who does have Illustrator and Photoshop skills, do get in touch, either via live, live chat or whatever, because uh, we are. I had a point where two weeks ago I lost two staff in one week. Oh. And just before Christmas, not the best time. So I very quickly managed to get another apprentice. He's a brilliant Josh. If you ever go to Print by Magic and you speak to someone on the phone, it's often Josh who deals with the laying out of the cards now and the printing. Uh, before that, it was Scott for five years. He was uh, he was brilliant. So I am looking for uh, another person to work who is always great if you've got someone who has a bit of um, experience within the magic community as well, because you are often designing playing cards for this magician and they need specific angles of blank before the pip starts. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if it sounds interesting to anyone, please do get in touch. That's amazing. Again, by the live chat. Yeah? Yeah, so, yeah. 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 That's yeah. Okay. Okay, so I want to ask you one more question before I, yeah, I yeah. go for my final question, which is, um, do you have any advice? You, you know, you've created your own magic tricks. Yeah. You print playing cards for creators of magic tricks. You release magic tricks for other creators through your company, Magic World. Yeah. Do you have any advice when it comes to creating a magic trick? Um, any advice at all? Because it's that, it's that holy grail goal for a lot of magicians. I want to create yeah. my own trick. Wow. Now, I never know what to really say to this question. There's so many great, so much great advice out there from so many great magicians. Um, for me, I went through a stumbling block maybe about six, seven years ago. Is like, how do I become creative? How do I come up with tricks? I don't have any ideas. And I remember reading lots of books on creativity. I listened to, I think it was Jay Sankey did a DVD or a CD on creativity and creating your own magic. And I think some of these helped to get a couple of them is what I'd say is that Jay Sankey one really helped with the creativity at the time. But again, I think it more came down to learn fun. It depends what you want to create. Do you want to create the next mind reading miracle, which is going to require heavy thoughts and ideas or easy simple magic have an idea of what you what your outcome is what kind of trick you want to develop uh like Vinny has a very clear three stages of what he wants to uh every trick has to match to be able to before he even thinks about creating it so have a clear idea of the difficulty what you'd like to create then the idea itself just come up with an idea don't think about how to do it the method for me anyway I, the idea comes into my mind when I am never thinking about magic. It often comes into my mind when I'm watching a movie. Um, I always have my cards in my hand, so I might be watching the film. That's what I used, you know, I used to enjoy more than anything with Cineworld and just being sat there watching a movie. And is that you or me? Oh, oh that's this bit... live here. Don't worry, I'm going <laughs> to fix that. Um, here we go. I've got new lights in here, so. There you go. Is that going to improve things? It's going to be have to sit on the table like that, but... No, that's fine. That looks that's good. Work? Okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Where were we? So um, it's come up with the product itself, an idea of something, what you want to create. So you want to make something vanish, something happen to this. Uh, yeah, whatever it is, come up with the actual idea itself, then think, figure out a way to do it. And uh, there's always a way. And sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. And you write every single idea down in your notebook. And sometimes you, you I would say, write every single idea go, you, down. You'll go back to it a week later or a few days later. Some will be great idea. Some of them you think, ah, oh, that's rubbish. Don't delete it yet. Go back another few days and go through it. And then if you still think it's bad, 
clear it off the list, make a clear list of the ones that you're passionate about, the ones that you enjoy, because that's what it comes from. But most of my ideas didn't come from uh, watching other people's doing magic. It was more from while I'm watching a movie, or oh, wouldn't it be great if this could happen? Occasionally, yeah. some ideas did come from, I guess, I don't, I'm trying to think where certain tricks came from, but they, they came along with collaboration with other magicians. So mm. I would show an idea I have to a fellow magician and say, oh, that's really good, that. But what if you do it this way? Tried it this way. And because of that, that completely changed this trick out of the blue, which was, um, not sure if you're aware of it, but they, they touch a card, they think about it, you snap your fingers, and you go through the cards and it's vanished. Very simple method, but it fools magicians. But... Uh, Vinny helped me out with this in a pub and it was like why don't you take it one step further it's like you show some blue cards first both sides very simple handling you put them into the spectator's hand now you make the card vanish from there from the red deck and appears in the blue deck so just adding one little tweak to it can completely change it so collaborating I would say is fun as well but being careful how you collaborate because some people will steal your ideas yeah only has, trust yeah. your really best mates with it it's very true. It's very, yeah. very true. Very, very true. Well, okay. I'm yeah. Trying to think of any other advice I have on that. Really, it's like it is just. It will come. That's kind of all I'm going to say. Is like if you don't have any ideas right now, don't force them out. Just learn new tricks. Spend time learning your card magic and your um, technique as such, and not so much slights of hand, but more actual routines. Delve into the books. Learn, a, learn one trick a week. Just play around with it. Don't force yourself too much. And eventually, the ideas are just going to start coming. And they will just flow, if that's yeah. where you want to go. But first, create the magic for yourself is probably what I would do most. Like, uh, I'm trying not to do a product placement here. Blistering. Blistering, I created this purely for myself. It was the blister on a key ring. It's been done before out of certain objects, but we wanted it to be something that was durable that was on your side here that you could squeeze any time and you got a perfect impression on your hand yeah. and it was out of passion for creating something i wanted to do in, in the in the real world that came about for creating that and yeah. uh then yeah, yeah that makes sense yeah it's just have fun well, well here's a question for you out yeah. of everything that magic world has released yep what is your favorite trick and out of every trick you've ever seen that's not Magic World, what's your yep. favourite trick? Because you stock everything, so you've seen a lot of stuff. I see a lot. Right. I'll try and say my favourite... Th right, I'm going to say what I think is going to be my favourite trick that's going to be coming soon. So Fair I'm, enough. Uh, it's a trick I will be releasing. It's going to be probably a month or two. I can't really say the... I'm not going to say too much because, of course, it's going to be a golden pipeline product. However, it's called Squeeze. That's all I'm going to say. And I think I've demonstrated it in the past, but it's, it's just a really fun trick. Squeezing a playing card down into miniature sizes. And uh, they have souvenirs. And that's all I'm going to say. It's a wonderful little trick. It's fun. It's the kind of trick that I would do uh, at a gig. And it's visual. It's it just And it leaves them with a souvenir. So that's one of my favourite tricks at the moment. That will be coming out in about a month to two um, with Murphy's. One of my favourite all-time... My two favourite tricks I've released probably are The Experiment by Vinny Segu, which I, we do have on our website. I know Murphy's have stopped selling it now, um, but that's one of my all-time favourite tricks. I do that. Have you ever seen it? Yes, it's really yeah. good. Yeah, the one with the ESP and, and two sets of ESP cards. And yeah. it's one of those tricks that is self-working. You don't have to do any work. And the other day I was at a corporate gig because... Um, how, do, how do I say this nicely? Right. Have you had that feeling when you go back to a gig after all of the things that have been going on and the very first or second gig that you've done, you can't remember anything? You In there, bought that, yeah, bought yeah. the T-shirt, yeah. Yeah, I got there and I was like, okay, I rehearsed a bit at home again just to get myself back in the swing, but I can't remember the flow of how I got from one trick to another. Some of the things I said, I forgot and everything. So uh, I got out the experiment and I did that at one point. Because I was just, you know, when you have a brain freeze and you think, oh, what can I do next? What I'm going to do next? I did this. And it blew them away. And for me, it's such an easy, simple trick. But for them, it absolutely slayed this corporate audience. I was like, who are we to say a little packet trick is not going to absolutely blow people away about how much fun they have? 
So that's one of my favourites. Then Listerine, because I carry it everywhere I go. Um, and Out of the Blue is probably my favourite of our effects. But to be honest, I love them all, really, because they've all got something close to my heart. I suppose if, if you didn't love them, you wouldn't have released yeah. them. Yeah. There's a couple of tricks that, you know, I've not released officially, but I only like, in, like releasing tricks that I really believe in, that I enjoy performing. And again, that comes down to what I do when I create a product. Or if I work with somebody, it's got to be a trick that I really enjoy. Uh, another one, for instance, is tactical. That's one of my all-time favourite tricks. And that's when oh. we have a mini tic-tac box and you throw it, it turns into a full-size box. And it yes. has a mini, mini deck of cards going into a large deck. It's so easy to perform. It blows people away. And, uh, and you get two gimmicks in a pack. But I do that all my corporate walk around. It's amazing. There you go. So try not to just plug my own products. I'm trying to be honest. <laughs> you know, well, I, as I am you know. This one at the moment. I'm learning ABC. That's going to be on the next review show. I think, have you just, did you do one on this recently? I haven't done a review on it yet, but nope. it's coming soon. Yeah, me too. I, I was playing around with the cars, really impressed with them so far as well, the bicycle and all that. But uh, that's my next thing. And was it Switcher 2 I saw you do a review on the other day? Yes, yeah, that's right. great. I love Not Switcher not watched it too. yet, but I will watch it. But yeah, I'll I love do one on that. I love Switcher 2. It's really, really good. And my favourite book at the moment, just so I'll share it with people, is this one here. Pepe Carroll, 52 Lovers. Oh, wow. Okay. Spanish magician and his classic card magic is absolutely to die for. But um, I think I got this because I saw Danny Doughty do one of the tricks um, in his own, his own version. And, and I asked him, where, where could I learn this from? And he said, get this book. So that's my, my favourite book. I haven't moment. seen that book, so I'm going to go and order that as soon as well I Well worth off. it. Well worth wow. it. Wow. That's cool. Well, yeah. let me ask you one last question, James. Sure. Final, final question, which is, uh, what's next, my friend? I mean, you've done mm. so much. You know, we've talked about all the different things that yeah. you've done, ice skating, hypnotherapy, yeah. uh, stage magic, illusions, yeah. hypnotism. Show. I mean, the list lot, goes on and on and on. What is it? That is, what's next? Is there anything left on your magical bucket list that you haven't yet achieved that you would like to achieve? Definitely. Um, this is going to be within five years because I'm not going to do it immediately. I've not got enough time. Pen and Teller Fools, I'd like to go on that. Simple as. Okay. Britain's Got Talent, I'd like to go on that again. I did go on, on it once, but uh, as a double act, as an illusionist, I'd like to go on and do something myself with that. Okay. But for the moment, it is building up the printing business, continuing the magic shop and building up the magic world. And I don't think I, and bring up my time. That's what I want to do next. Just free up my time, ha, enjoy the weekends, go out for more walks instead of constantly working. So for me, just being able to free up my time and enjoy learning a new trick rather than having to learn it because I have to review it or having to learn it, having to focus on a trick that I'm selling or to understand it better. I want to do it for myself. Maybe a bit yeah. selfish, but I think we've got to be sometimes. I completely agree. I completely agree. And that's a very good, that's a very good goal. 100%. I think bringing up time, that's the thing. I think one of my big goals is also to make as much money as I can in the amount, littlest amount of work possible. <laughs> yeah. And why not? I mean, but at the same time, do it well. Yeah. So. Work smart, not hard. Exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. You know all about that. Yeah, I mean, that's the biggest piece of advice that anybody could get from this yes. whole interview. Work smart, not hard. Absolutely. Yes. Don't be a busy fool and all those exactly. buzzwords. Exactly. And you know what? This has been an incredible interview, and I really hope that anybody who's watched this will support you. Um, they can get on your mailing list, right? Um, yeah. I was going to say, I mean, I only just thought about this a few minutes ago. Would it be great to offer everyone who watches this a discount on both Print by Magic and Magic Wall? I think they would love that. 100%. Right. So what I'll do is I won't say the code now, but I'll give you a yeah. code that if it's possible, you could post with the video. And both yeah, websites... I'll, put it in the, I'll put it in the description down below and I'll put right. it up on the screen. So when we edit it, it's Brilliant. flashing up on the screen right now. That's the code. And it'll be down in the description and that'll give you a discount, right? Fantastic. It's only fair. And, and you know what? I, I really highly recommend your company. I know we've talked about this off camera. I'm doing a review show special on Magic World very, yep. very soon. That'll Brilliant. be dropping in the next couple of weeks. 
Um, but you know, if you if you want to support James, go check out the the website. The link's going to be in the in the description down below. Also, go check out Crimp, Print by Magic. If you've got a crazy idea for a card gimmick, yeah, James yeah. can print it to you and make it. Hey, you know what? You can have your business. Imagine having your business cards on a yeah. playing yeah. card. Imagine having a deck of double uh, of blank backed cards, and somebody signs a card on the face, and the back changes into a playing card. Uh, sorry, oh. changes from a playing card into a business card. One of the big ones at the moment is that I've got loads of magicians who are doing weddings all over because they're going crazy right, right now. And they upsell a deck of cards printed with their image on the back, maybe a date as well. So they send me the image or a logo for the corporate company. We print out the deck. We can print out custom boxes as well. And they're selling them for, well, we, we might sell a deck of cards for £22. They're selling them for £40 to the actual end user. And it's win-win for all of us. So, but that's been a very big thing is upsells to your clients. And, you know, that's the sort of thing that a wedding, a bride and groom at a wedding would love to do. Yeah. You know, would you like every single person that comes to your wedding to have a souvenir deck of cards to take away with them? Oh, my gosh, what a great idea. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, that's you. awesome. So there you go. There's, a, there's, there's so many things that you can do by visiting Print by Magic. And you are uh, an inspiration. You do so much. You work so hard. And you've always been successful at everything you've done. And I know whatever goals you have in the future, you will hit them and you will continue to hit them because you're just one of those people. You're one of those people that... I hope so. Is and you too. With yours. That <laughs> oh, thank you, mate. Thank you. So what I want everyone to do is leave a, uh, leave a comment down below. I'm sure James will see it. If you haven't already, go subscribe to the Magic World YouTube channel because James is youtube channel is popping there's a lot of great reviews on there support everything that this man does and look out for him because apparently in the next few years you're going to see him on bgt and fool us so that's going to be maybe not in the exciting. same five years maybe five years <laughs> for one five years for another <laughs> absolutely well i'll be looking out for you my friend and uh and one more time thank you so much for coming on the channel i really appreciate it absolutely we'll pleasure. get that now we'll get that review show special done very very soon because i want people to see just how amazing your stuff is thank you so much for bringing me on it's been a really good time. I've enjoyed it and I can't wait to see it live. Awesome. Guys, thank you so much. On behalf of James and Magic World and myself, I'll see you again soon. Um, join us again. My name's Craig from Magic TV. Mm -hmm.